Hello everyone, this is Sabrina Whitzel at NHSK. I'll just give everyone else another minute or so to join in on the webinar and then we'll get started. Okay, everyone, let's get started. So thank you so much for joining us on today's webinar titled Understanding and Addressing Adverse Childhood Experiences, Part 1, Building Resilience and Healing from Trauma in Early Childhood Settings. I'm Sabrina Whitfield. I'm a Policy and Research Associate here at the National Head Start Association, and I am thrilled about this webinar today because this is the first to kick off our mini-series, Understanding and Addressing Adverse Childhood Experiences, which is a very critical topic and potentially one of the most important topics facing Head Start today. Uh, but before we dive into why we're doing this webinar series and what we'll cover, I wanted to share a little bit more about MHSA and our mission and vision and why we strive to support the Head Start community through policy work and advocacy, professional development through our six uh, professional development conferences, and joining skill together to share and highlight effective and model practices in Head Start through a variety of different ways, like webinars, virtual training, online communication platforms, along with a lot of other things. But all this work is really driven by our mission and our vision. And so our vision is to lead, is to be the untiring voice uh, that will not rest and, to, uh, and will not be quiet until every vulnerable child is served with a Head Start model of support for the whole child, the family, and community. And it's to advocate to work diligently for policy change to ensure all vulnerable children and families have what they need to succeed. And our mission is to coalesce, to inspire, and to support the Head Start field as a leader in early childhood development and education. So with that in mind, I would like to share a little bit more information about how this webinar series was developed and where we hope to go from here. I hope a lot of you remember the Year Full Health Initiative. This is a year-long initiative that ran through the program year last year where we shared webinars, blogs, and resources each month focused on a different topic broadly related to health in some way. And this was informed through our 2018 Effective Practice Survey. We, since we got such a great response from the Year of Whole Health, we wanted to continue this work, but reassess our topics. Uh, so we launched the 2019 Effective Practice Survey to learn more. And thank you so much to everyone who took the survey. It's extremely important for us to gather your thoughts and feedback. And so what did we find from this survey? Lots of really interesting and helpful information that informs our conference content, policy work, and our strategic directions. And we also, and so we found um, that, that a lot of the, the problems that exist right now, that, that people find are, are hiring quality staff with the right credentials, retaining staff and reducing burnout, engaging families and taking CGEN to the next level, supporting the mental and physical well-being of staff to name some, and supporting children with challenging behaviors and children and families with unique mental health needs. So this is the, the information that shaped this webinar series. So our, our last webinar series was about supporting staff and, and reducing burnout. Um, and this series is, is about understanding and addressing the first childhood experiences. This one is specifically about building resilience and healing from trauma in early childhood settings. And keep an eye out uh, for our next webinar in the series, which will cover a few case studies of Head Start programs that are providing exemplary trauma-informed care models uh, and offer an opportunity to learn more about funding implementation in fiscal year 2020. So now that you have a better understanding of what we hope to achieve and where we hope to go with this multi-series, I'm going to finally jump into today's webinar. 
Today we will get uh, we have the opportunity to hear from two phenomenal experts in the field who are doing really amazing work uh, around resiliency. And while they share, I am hoping that you will also have the chance to share your work or questions that you may have, and you can use the, the question box so that we can engage in the discussion. And so to do that, I want to share just a few tech suggestions to make sure that we get the most out of this one hour webinar. We would love as much engagement as possible and I encourage you to use the questions and comment boxes on your webinar toolbar. We will address uh, your questions hopefully at the, at the end of the webinar. Uh, and if you'd like to, to say anything, please just use uh, the raise your hand icon uh, on, on your toolbar uh, and I can unmute you from here. Uh, I also want to share that these slides are provided in a PDF form as a handout in your webinar toolbar. Make sure that you download those before the end of the webinar. Uh, and this webinar is also being recorded so that you will have access to the recording. Um, but just make sure that you download the handout so that you have access to the slides and all the links that are provided in this webinar um, after it concludes. And then uh, throughout the webinar, we will have a couple polls and questions just so that we can get a sense of, of who's on the webinar today. Uh, and so without further ado, I will launch the first poll. Okay, thank you. And then I'll launch the other poll. Okay, and I think you can answer this one as well. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. So without further ado, I will hand it over to our two amazing presenters today, Nefertiti Pointer and Rachel Wagner at the at Debra, the Center for Resilient Children. Thank you, Sabrina. All right, Rachel, you have control. You want to hand it to me? I don't know that I, I can control that. Sabrina can give you the, the keyboard, not me. Okay, all right. Well, we first wanted to say good afternoon. I was so excited to say hi to you. I popped in before Sabrina uh, began. My name is Nefertiti Prainer. I am an early child specialist and national trainer with the Devereaux Center for Resilient Children. And Rachel and I are so excited to have the next few minutes to spend with you. Rachel? I think that's it. I wanna use the precious hour that we have to get to content. So hello, everyone. We're so excited to be here with you. Um, and Nefertiti and I do a very similar job. We both travel the country. We are national trainers. We're early childhood specialists for Devereaux. We focus on resilience and social emotional well-being as our passion and our career. So we are excited to spend some time with you today. I'll let Nefertiti take it away. You'll see us bop back and forth for the hour that we'll be together. All right, thanks. Thank you, Rachel. All right, so Sabrina is going to kind of help me advance my slides. I don't have control at the moment. So Sabrina is going to have to listen to all my stories so she knows how to move us forward. First of all, again, thank you. Um, we're excited to share these next few minutes with you. We really want to do this together. 
So at some time during the day, we're actually going to see, you're going to see a bubble with the words reflect. When you see the word reflect, we want you to do just that. You were able to secure these moments away from all of your work life, and we are super excited about that. So sometimes we're going to ask you to reflect. Sometimes we're also going to ask you to chat, and we're going to see if, um, if Sabrina is working on that for us so we can make sure. Thank you, Sabrina. I see you talking to me over there, um, where we can make sure you can chat with us and we can, we can see your responses. So Sabrina, if you're close by, just go ahead and advance it because I can't, it'll probably too too much too, much, too cumbersome to try to do it myself. So if you're close by, go ahead and advance the next slide for me. Okay. All right. So before we began talking about some of the most important people that we know, and that is children, I wanna also make sure that you know that the only way you're gonna do this work is if you consider your own wellness. And so today we support NHSA efforts, NHSA's effort around staff well-being and staff workforce wellness. You can't do this if you're not first taking care of yourself. So whatever you need to do during today's webinar to stay present, to make sure you keep the shut up looks away. You know the shut up looks we give our presenters when they've gotten long and boring. We know that look. We wanna make sure you do what you can to make sure you take care of yourself. Sabrina, go ahead and move to the next slide for me. <laughs> Let's start with this learning objective. Let's talk about raising an awareness around resilience and trauma. And as Rachel said, we're gonna go back and forth this afternoon and we're gonna do our best to share the information and be able to pause to take in your comments, questions, and concerns. So I'll see you in just a few minutes. Great, thank you, Nefertiti. Let's start with the exciting, easy to swallow stuff, and we'll move into some of the harder stuff as we make our way through. And again, I'll remind you, as Nefertiti did, that this subject matter, while we're talking about kids, we know also impacts you as grown-ups. Please take care of yourself as we make our way through this content. Nefertiti and I always like to start our conversation about resilience. And one of the ways we like to start that conversation is with one of our favorite quotes, which is, life is a journey, pack carefully. And the first time I heard this quote, I thought it was our anthem. I think for all people who work in early childhood, life is a journey packed carefully probably means a lot to us when we think about children. And so the way that I think about this is that every child is born with a suitcase. The suitcase is wide open and ready to be packed. And in the early years of life, the suitcase is our metaphor for the brain. The suitcase is wide open. And we have the opportunity to put things in the suitcase or in the brain that stay in the brain. So positive experiences stay in the brain. Also difficult experiences stay in the brain. And we know that we get kids during the most exciting time of their lives. So when I'm traveling across the country and people say, what do you do? It's very hard to tell people and explain to people what we do and the importance of it. I usually joke with them and say, I pack suitcases. Um, and they think I'm talking about my work as a person who's on the road a lot. But what I really mean is I do and you do the most important job in the world, which is we are people who support the packing of suitcases. And so I'd like for folks to take a minute to think about if you could pack the dream suitcase for a child, if you could get everything you know a child needs, let's say before the age of six in the suitcase that they're gonna need for life's journey, what are the things that you wanna have in there? And we, um, I think Nefertiti and I assumed that the chat box was gonna be open for the entire group to be able to chat with us. Um, if that is not an option for you to chat uh, live with us, what we'll ask you to do when you see the chat box come up is we'll ask you to grab a piece of paper and jot down is I think maybe somebody's trying to make it possible. Sabrina, do you want to chime in and let us know if it's possible? Yeah, so I think that it looks like I can assign, I can I can make sure that the questions are visible to, to one or one or both of you, uh, one of the two of you, um, whenever they come in. Okay, so they would be typing in the box that indica that's indicated as questions? Okay, so let's test this, friends. 
if you could think about what you want in the suitcase for children and go ahead and in the question box in your control panel to the right, could you go ahead and type in something you want like love or empathy or compassion? Um, what are some of the things you want to have typed in? We'll see if I can see them coming in on the question box. Okay, we wanted to make sure that kids feel important and worthy, that they feel love and safety. I can see them. Thank you, Sabrina. That they're able to regulate their emotions. It's showing me in a very small window, but I'm going to make it work. Um, a lot I'm seeing emotional regulation put in the suitcase. Resilience and security and acceptance and love and social emotional competence. And my friends, if I'm not saying all of them back to you, it's just because they're moving pretty quick and I wanna make sure that I just uh, give you the highlights that I can and then keep the show rolling. Uh, Joy said manners, healthy relationships. I love all of these curiosity, adventure, security, self-confidence. I love all of your answers. You are suitcase packers, my friends. And so you can go ahead and keep loading those in. They're wonderful responses, loving environments, caring environments I'm seeing. And I am in love with your answers because isn't this the dream? All the things that you guys are saying you wanna get in that suitcase for kids, they, those are the things we know are the most important things, and they happen to share a common trait. They happen to have some similar qualities, these things that you are indicating that you want. So, uh, Sabrina, if you could advance the slide two clicks for me. Go ahead, one more. The common trait that every single thing you put in the suitcase had was that they were social and emotional things. I do this across the country. I say, what do you want on the suitcase? And people always say the things you say and they never say money and they never say algebra. They always say social and emotional things. And so what we know to be true is that if we can get social and emotional health in the suitcase early on, and Sabrina, can you advance for me? Early on, we can Keep clicking for me, my love. We, if we can get it in the suitcase early on, we can support children's resilience for the rest of their lives. So a good suitcase early means a pretty resilient life for the rest of life. So what do we mean by resilience? You can advance again. Resilience is defined as the ability to recover from or adjust to misfortune. And if you click again, it's the ability most simply to bounce back. And we like to think about kids and we like to think about grownups in terms of having the ability to experience misfortune and change in our lives. But then of course, if your rubber band gets like this, that you have the ability to bounce back, that you have the qualities and characteristics that you need in your suitcase to help you deal with the misfortune and change in your life. If you could click again for me, go ahead and keep clicking one more. There we go. And as we look at one back, as we look at resilience research. It's a nice idea to have a bunch of humans, especially little humans who can bounce back. There's a lot of research behind our efforts to support children's resilience. And one of our uh, sort of beacons of resilience research is a woman by the name of Ann Maston. And what she reminds us is that resilience is made of ordinary rather than extraordinary processes. Meaning what? Meaning that if we can do sort of small things. That's what helps with resilience. It doesn't mean we have to 
you know, buy expensive things or do extravagant experiences. It's in the little moments that we share with children that create the love and the empathy and the caring and the self-confidence and the curiosity and all the things you want in the suitcase happen in the little moments. And so we want you to focus today with us on ordinary magic. So if you can click for me, I have another chat question for you. If you can enter into the question box, how does the ordinary practice of labeling kids cubbies support their resilience? So in most early care and education environments, if kids have cubbies, we put their names on them. It's an ordinary, regular old practice, but what does that, how does that practice support a child's resilience? So go ahead and type for me in the question box, how you think that supports a child's resilience and gives them a sense of belonging. It shows that they are part of a community and that they are important. It promotes self-help skills and builds confidence. Confidence and belonging again, a place, a sense of place within the classroom. I didn't tell you when we introduced ourselves, but I started my career 20 years ago in Head Start and I love my Head Start friends. You guys are beautiful. I love what you're saying. It shows their ownership in the classroom and that they are part of the environment and that they are cared for. And so keep keep reflecting on that. It's just labeling cubbies, right? It's just labeling cubbies. But when we think about what that means to a child, it's so powerful. And I used to work in a therapeutic preschool where we took kiddos who had been expelled from three other preschools before they came to us. And I had one little guy, I will call him Tommy. He had been expelled from five preschools. He was five years old. He was a very big five-year-old. And we were a little worried about inviting him into our program. And I remember I met him on the first day and I walked him around and we had labeled his cubby and his cot and his place at the table and his chair. And there was something like, he looked at us like, this is mine, this is mine. And I literally believe that it changed our relationship. It changed how he felt in the room. And it was ordinary magic resilience is in these little things like labeling cubbies. So again, if you could advance for me, that brings us into the arena of thinking about trauma sensitive practices where we are doing things to help children feel a sense of safety, trustworthiness, have choices and feel empowered in safe, nurturing, calm and consistent relationships in the context of those. And so we're going to be circling back to that today, but if you'll click for me again, this begs the conversation about why everyone is talking so much these days about trauma and toxic stress and trauma sensitive practices. And so if we advance again to the next slide, Nefertiti is going to take it over and she's going to tell you a little bit about adverse childhood experiences. Thank you, Rachel. It's always nice to sit back and, and take it in as, as you're talking. So let's talk a little bit about adverse childhood experiences. You know, last night as I listened to the Democratic National, uh, the Democratic Convention, I wanted to hear someone use the language we're talking about today because everything that we're talking about when we talk about adults begins at this stage of our development. So the adverse childhood experience study brought to our attention what can happen before the age of 18 that gets into our bodies that turns into who we become as adults. And so again, I think many of you, I would say are probably very familiar with the ACE work, the ACEs study. It's, it's becoming more commonplace to hear it, which is exciting. But if this is your first time hearing about any of this, Rachel and I would really encourage you to record, listen to this recording again, and then make it your to-do list to go and learn a little bit more. There are certain things that can happen in our life before we are the age of 18, and there are things like physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. There is when you have domestic, excuse me, mental illness within the home, parent dysfunction, incarceration, things like that that are not in your control, 
but that they start to shape who you who you are, who you become as a, an adult. But there is some good news about the ACE work. Sabrina, fast forward this slide for me. What, what we know is that the, the, the higher your ACE score, the greater the risk for negative health outcomes. One more time, Sabrina. And when we say negative outcomes, what does that look like? Well, the research says you are more likely to be less active. You may adopt smoking habits. You may have an addiction habit. You may turn to drug use as one of your ways to cope and manage. You may miss your work. You may have unhealthy body weight. These are some of the things that we see in the research. We also see diabetes. We see depression. We see suicide attempts. We see heart disease. Fast forward for me, please, Sabrina. Read the, read, this, read the yellow part of the slide for just a moment. Yeah. This is why I want to hear those that are responsible for making our laws and legislation. I need to hear more of this. And I think I'm not alone in that. No matter where you are across party lines, I think this is important because we are working with the most important people that we know, babies, toddlers, and preschoolers, but they are a part of a village. And if you've heard the old African proverb that says, it takes a village to raise a child, what we know for sure is that it takes a healthy village to raise a healthy child. We gotta get healthy. Sabrina, keep going for me. I told you there's some good news. I'm still trying to cement you around the fact that the, lot, the higher your A score, the more likely you are to have these not so positive life outcomes. But Nefertiti, you said there's some good news. Where is the good news? Keep going for me, Sabrina. The good news is that, and don't let anybody ever let you stop at just the A score, right? The good news is that we can get this right. If we can the word is neuroplasticity. That's the word we say in the research. It's my favorite word. I can't spell it, but I can say it. And it reminds me that if we can heal the brain, the body can catch up and things can be better because this is what we don't want to happen. Stress can destroy much more than just our physical health, but all too often it takes away our hope, our belief, and our faith. And I would ask you, is there a person that you know that has lost faith? They've lost hope they've lost belief. That's worse than the stress level, right? And so reflect with me for just a second and say, let's just transition a little bit and think about this word trauma. Again, just for a second or two in the interest of time, think about this word trauma. Keep going for me, Sabrina. Trauma is can be thought of as the three E's. Um, Sabrina, click the button three times because I want to highlight something for the team. It's an event or series of an events. It's the way those events are experienced and it's the effect it has on you. Today, we're stopping to talk with you about this, the students that you're supporting who may have some events that could be perceived as traumatic. How is that event being experienced by the child and the family? That's where the trauma starts to happen. And then what is the effect it has on the mind, the body, and the spirit? That's trauma, events experienced and the way it affects. Keep going for me, please. Oftentimes I hear people say, well, Nefertiti, I, did, I dealt with some of the same stuff that my brother dealt with, but it turned out this way for him or this way for her. Absolutely, team, when you get off this webinar, remind somebody that, People experience stress and trauma differently. Keep going for me, please. The reality is no matter if Rachel and I experience the same thing, if my mom and I experienced the same thing, if my brother and I had experienced the same thing, we experience the stress differently. And as a result, it impacts the mind, the body, and the spirit in a different way. Keep going for me, please. When we think about stress levels, and again, I think these are things where I just wanna make sure it feels good so that you can tell somebody else because maybe your co-teacher isn't fully there with you yet, or maybe the 
the, the person down the hall from you isn't there with you yet, you're still doing like I did and I slapped my hands for it, this child needs a referral. That's what he needs. Get him out of here. He needs a referral. Not every child needs a referral. Sometimes it's figuring out some of this stuff. So stress levels. There is a such thing as positive stress. Can you believe it? There's a such thing as tolerable stress. And then there's a such thing as toxic stress. So Sabrina, just pause, continue to the next one for me. Let's just make this make sense for 30 seconds. There is some things that happen in your life, in the life of children, that can be considered positive stress. I have a five-year-old who's going to start kindergarten in September. I think that might be an example of positive stress. The body says, oh, this is different. This is new. But the body can handle it. Keep going for me, Sabrina. When you think about, when you think about positive stress, think, and just because just I don't want you to chat with me because we need to move on in the interest of time. But what? can you think about our examples of positive stress? If you wanna go ahead and chat it, go ahead and type it, Rachel's in the chat box, she can read it for me. But when you think about examples of positive stress, either in your life or in the children that you're supporting, what do you think about? Examples of positive stress, all right? Keep going for me while you're thinking about that. Let's do the next one. I see new jobs. Yes, that's a good one. Good, that's a good one, new jobs. All right, so look what I put up here, Autumn. I said getting married. You know, that whole process can be exciting and stressful. New job, you said that. Graduation, I see somebody say. Selling your house or buying a house, that's a positive stress. And my mother, I put that one up there for her. Holidays, that's a positive stress for her. She needs everything to be okay when she's doing that kind of stuff. Thinking about the children that we support, as well as ourselves, we all deal with some levels of positive stress. The body says, it feels a little different, but I can handle it. Keep going, Sabrina. Let's talk a little bit about this next part. This is where we're starting to think a little bit about, and, and if when we put this in our full day training, this slide is actually yellow because this level of stress starts to trigger your body. And your body is kind of saying, okay, what is this? It feels a little different. It feels a little weird. And when you're four and you're having to deal with this, ugh, they can sometimes be pretty yucky. And that's our word we use when we just don't know how else to say, this can get difficult. But the good news again, and because I don't want you to leave this webinar feeling like you don't know how to do this. The good news is that when you have a good support system, they can help you turn this red light, this yellow light to a green light. Sabrina, keep going to the next slide for me. Um, we wanted to talk about some examples of tolerable stress. The loss of a loved one could be considered tolerable stress for someone. Divorce and separation could be considered tolerable stress. Having to find a new job and even dealing with short-term illnesses, those things could be considered tolerable stresses. Continue to the next slide for me, Sabrina. I don't want you to leave me today, Rachel, or we don't want you to leave today without um, really remembering and thinking about the fact that one of the most important things you can do today is make sure you have a buffer. You and I are gonna walk through all levels of stress and so are the children that we're supporting. But one thing that both they need and we need as adults is a buffer. Your buffer is that person that can look at you and say, I will hold this for you. Your buffer is a person who you can call and you don't have to get those words right to talk to him or her. They just are ready to be there for you. That person is your buffer. And so for 30 seconds, I just want you to type the name of your buffer into the chat box. We don't need to know the story. We don't need to know how they serve as your buffer. We just want you to shine on them for just a moment. Type your person's, type your buffer into the chat box. For just 30 seconds, we're gonna do this. All right. If I could, if I wasn't scared to type, I'd have a, several names that I type, but I'm scared to touch anything over here today. So Sabrina, keep going for me. You chat your buffer's name. One more time, please. Our whole team is a buffer. That's nice to hear, Jamie. That's nice to hear. 
I want to do toxic stress with the team, Sabrina. So if you could go to those slides, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. This is the prolonged activation of the stress response system. The prolonged activation of the stress response system. We call it the red light. It is things that you're dealing with in an ongoing manner, sometimes without the protective support of your buffer, and your body says, I don't like this. It hurts me. And again, when you deal with this when we're in our 40s, that's one thing. But children also experience toxic levels of stress. And just think about what it's like to have toxic stress packed into your backpack, packed into your suitcase. That's why we're here today, because we are working with some children who have toxic stress in their backpack. Sabrina, fast forward to the next slide for me. As you say, Nefertiti, Rachel, what are some examples of toxic stress? Anything that we went over today that goes on for too long without supports to make it better or the supports of a buffer, a healthy buffer, those things can be considered toxic stress. And again, I think you and I are working with children who are experiencing toxic stress. I thank my mother for although we went through a lot of things, she did her best to keep these levels of stress out of my suitcase, out of my brother's suitcase. And when I was a teacher, even without knowing these fancy words for it, I felt that was part of my job to keep the toxic stress to a minimum and or be the buffer for, for that child. So what, what, what's, this, what's this quote say? Often it isn't the initiating trauma that creates these seemingly insurmountable pain. It's doing it by yourself. It's the kind of doing it by yourself. That's when it starts to hurt and feel super yucky. Fast forward for me, please, Sabrina. These are the things that we see in the ACE work that can be defined as toxic stress. And just look at it for 30 seconds and ask yourself, are you working with a child who are experiencing any of these things? Is any of, has any of this got packed into his or her suitcase? Physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse, parental mental illness, incarcerated family members, mother treated violently, divorce or separation. This is why we're here today because we want to figure out the best ways to support children who have this in their suitcase. Keep going for me, please. What happens when children have stress and traumatic, toxic stress and, what happens when children have stress and toxic stress in their suitcase? Rachel's gonna keep us moving on this and I'll be back in a little bit to give you some strategies to think about that hopefully you can try tomorrow. Thank you, Nefertiti. So this is the heavy stuff and I will, uh, I think I can take the control, Sabrina. I'm going to try to see if I can advance my own slides. We'll see if it works. So when we have too much trauma and too much toxic stress in our lives and it is not buffered and it is not supported by an environment that makes us feel safe, it stresses out our brain. And some of you may be familiar with the expression that your brain flips its lid. And so I don't want to spend a ton of time on this. Many of you have probably already seen uh, the hand model. And the hand model that was created by Dr. Dan Sieg Siegel really sort of helps us to understand the brain. And so I'm going to do it super quick, but here we go. We've got this part. And if you want to play along with me, hold up your hand. We've got this part of our arm that we are going to call the spinal cord and then as we come to here we're going to call this the base of the skull or the brain stem and as we bring our thumb over this is the limbic system this is where our amygdala is and our hippocampus is and then all of this stuff the prefrontal and cerebral cortex is the stuff that comes over and sort of protects the the lower functioning parts of our brain and so when we think about all the brain stuff, and this is a lot of stuff and it's in your handouts, we wanna think about this limbic system part. And when kids are under stress and trauma, the amygdala fires up and says, am I safe? And it triggers that fight, flight, freeze that we know about that we're so familiar with. When that fight, flight, and freeze starts to fire up 
it starts to tell the hippocampus to release cortisol. And many of you know what cortisol does, but it starts to flood and its intention is to calm the amygdala. But if we have too much trauma and toxic stress and it isn't supported by a buffer, the cortisol starts to flood and it starts to get into the frontal cortex where we do all of our good stuff, our thinking and our good decision making and our, our ability to sort of make good choices. And when everything's working right, this stuff protects our lower downstairs brain. Our upstairs brain is more in charge. But when we have too much trauma, the amygdala fires up, the cortisol floods and we flip our lids and all the smart part of our brain stops working so well and our basic instincts start to kick in. And so hopefully that describes it as, as clearly as possible. But what we know then is that trauma impacts two areas. When the lid gets flipped, it impacts up here our ability to attach and our ability to regulate. And so for the rest of our conversation today, we wanna to focus on the ability to attach and the ability to regulate. And so I want you to reflect on a child that you know, and you'll see these six things up on the screen. And just think about, do you know a child who's very easily overly aroused, who's unable to think or use logic, who has increased impulsivity at activity levels, has a decreased ability to self-regulate, cannot tell the difference between danger and safety, and distort and has maybe a stort, distorted view of social experiences. And I can see you through this computer and I see lots of you nodding your head like I know so many kids who are exhibiting some of these signs of trauma. And when we see kids who are acting like this, we need to start shifting our focus. Instead of asking what's wrong with you, we need to ask what's happened to you, what has made this part fire? Because what we know is that when this part is firing and active, kids are in the fight, flight, freeze mode. And you'll see they. this is sort of the caveman part of our brain that existed when we were being chased by lions and tigers and bears, oh my. But when we're not being chased by lions and tigers and bears, we don't need this part of our brain to be overactive. And so when we're in fight mode, we get aggressive and irritable and defensive. We know kiddos who are like that. When we're in avoidant mode, we are flight mode, we're, we're under the table, we're isolating, we have anxiety and fear and we're hiding and we're, we're the freeze mode, we numb out, we detach, we give up, we stop speaking. And so this happens for kiddos who've experienced trauma and it's not always a lion. Sometimes it's just a change in the routine that feels like a lion uh, that triggers the amygdala. And so what we need to know about this and the good news is that we can fix this. We can do things to calm this down, to bring the prefrontal cortex back over to blanket uh, all of the sort of basic instincts that are happening for kids. And so I want to move forward into the next part of our conversation, which is about trauma-sensitive practices and leave you with some really concrete sort of strategies and tips and things to think about. But as we kick off that conversation, I think it's really important to share this quote. Will you read it with me? Not every child who acts out has trauma. And not every child who behaves is trauma-free. Let's be trauma-sensitive just in case. Even if we don't know a, tr a, a child's story, we're gonna, we're gonna be trauma sensitive just in case. So let's learn, let's move into learning some specific trauma sensitive practices that the research supports that lets us help kids really heal the part of their brain that is flooding. And so what we know, and Nefertiti used the word neuroplastic, neuroplasticity, is that the brain can heal. And it can heal in the context of nurturing and safe environments and relationships. And so I'll bring us back to what we learned, which is that trauma impacts our attachments and our emotional regulations. So those are the things that we wanna be trauma sensitive about. We wanna be trauma sensitive about our attachments and our emotional regulation supports for kids. And I'm gonna zero in on attachment. I'm gonna give you some concrete strategies 
um, about eight of them for attachment strategies and things to focus on. And then Nefertiti is gonna spend a little time right at the end giving you some emotional regulation strategies. So the first strategy that the research tells us to support children in trauma sensitive spaces around attachments and relationships is, I love this, stay in charge and at peace. <laughs> Easier said than done, right? So I want you to take a minute and reflect for yourself. You don't have to type anything. I just want you to think this through. How do you get yourself at peace and in charge? What do you do to make sure that you are at peace and in charge? Because kids feel it. Um, as a parent of four kids, they can tell when I'm not standing really firmly in a grounded place as their mama, and they know when I am not at peace. And so how do we find that peace? And it brings us back to the self-care conversation, but kids can tell, right? So one of the ways we support attachment is by being okay ourselves. Other ways that we can support attachment are to co-regulate with kids. Co-regulating is like rocking a baby, you're rocking, they're rocking. It's that soothing that we do together. And I'm not again gonna ask you to chat in the interest of time, but I would like you to think about just something simple, like side-by-side -side coloring with a child especially a child who may have experienced trauma or toxic stress. And as somebody who's always worked in mental health supports for young children, I have many a kiddo who won't necessarily engage with me head on. So if I sit side by side and I start to color and they're coloring side by side, what starts to happen? And it's that co-regulation, it's that attunement, it's a beautiful, gorgeous thing. And so again, I wanna sort of stress the ordinary magic of coloring side by side with a child that is trauma sensitive. It's supporting their resilience, it's creating attachments. And that is the stuff that buffers trauma. Some of the other strategies I have for you are of course, we already know this, but we need to always be reminded of it and do it more to validate feelings to enjoy things together. Oh my goodness, I just think about my, my youngest who's 10 who just had a birthday and he's still at the age where he likes trucks and things. And we got him some trucks and I don't love trucks. I don't love monster trucks, but he does. And I spent a good hour just playing monster trucks on the floor with him. And the connection I felt and the, that moment uh, was so important for us. And so to just enjoy some things together, to have hellos and goodbyes, to know the strengths, obviously, to help um, a child, I love this one, to help a child save face if they've done something that they weren't supposed to, how do we help them not feel that shame that often is associated with a lot of trauma and toxic stress in our lives. And then strategy number eight that I wanna provide for you is, to do a strategy that I call intentional promise keeping. And in the interest of time, I'm gonna tell you this Haley story super quickly. <sighs> intentional promise keeping is actually a strategy that I came up with over 20 years ago when I was working with children who had all experienced um, massive levels of toxic stress and trauma. And I worked with one little girl in particular who I will call Haley, who had tremendous attachment and relationship issues. She called me fat every day as a wonderful way to try to make me not like her. Uh, and she would kick me and punch me and slap me. And her favorite thing to do was to try to rip my eyeballs out. And she had been in three different foster care placements and expelled from four other early care and education settings. She had experienced all the ACEs um, in her first four years of life. And we knew that while we wanna do something a major and awesome, and maybe if we could buy the solution, we would, that it's really in these ordinary things. And so how do I get a child who has very limited attachment, who doesn't trust me to trust me? I do something called intentional promise keeping. So Haley and I had a common interest in peanut butter. I would invite her to be my peanut butter date. I put a little invitation in her cubby when there was peanut butter on the menu and she would get it and it would indicate to her that she was my date for lunch. Now, this was a hundred years ago before peanut allergies were an epidemic. So we had peanut butter a couple times a week. And when she'd get this invitation, 
the first couple times she'd get really sort of nervous, like all day she'd hold it in her hand before her lunch and she'd go around to all the kids, hey, I'm sitting with Rachel, you're not, I am. There was this anxiety around the fact that I might not make good on my promise. So you better believe when lunchtime came, I saved her seat and I made a big deal about keeping a promise. So after doing this several times, she started to get the invitation and just throw it back in her cup because she trusted me. And once that trust gets established, we can do so much more amazing work. We can do the, sort of the emotional regulation work because the attachment is there. And so just the process of doing this intentional promise keeping is sort of this very simple, ordinary way to build trust with kids who may not trust the grown-ups in their lives. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my buddy Nefertiti. She's going to take you through some strategies to help you think about emotional regulation. And Nefertiti, I'm going to give you a tip. If you okay. look over at the attendee uh, uh, box that shows all of our names, if you see yes. next to your image an arrow, a gray arrow, arrow, if you click that arrow, it will give you controls. You can advance your own slides. Let's see if that works. Yay! All right. Hey, thank you. Hey, thank You're you. Welcome. I got just tickled listening to Rachel say when the little girl, she said, I'm having lunch with Rachel. Uh, we both began our careers as teachers. And so we kind of understand where you are. And team members, we also want to remind you that sometimes children who have the most need will show it in the most unloving ways. Rachel has Haley. I had Kevin. It was some of the, the longest six months of my life. But I want to remind you until we see each other again, do it for the brain it will impact their heart. The strategies that Rachel and I are sharing with you today are designed to help heal that brain that may have had to deal with so much yuck, but it will impact the heart. And when the brain and the heart are in connection, oh my gosh, that is some great uh, work that can be done there. So again, we wanna get you out of here, but we also wanna give you some things that you can think about. So when you're thinking about helping your little ones process their emotions, Think about strategy number one, offering clear expectations. You may say, Nefertiti and Rachel, I already do that. Continue to do it. Do it for the brain, all right? Hold the structure, hold the structure. I think you may understand what we mean when we say hold the structure. Children who are experiencing trauma, like many children, they need consistency. And I'm going to say to you, if for any reason you know the day is not going to be consistent, then just tell this child. Children who are experiencing lots of risk and lots of trauma and lots of turmoil, they are, I like to always say, it's like being in a rocky boat. You know, I don't swim well. So if ever my husband gets me brave enough to get in the boat, if that boat start acting silly or crazy, I get nervous. But it also makes me think about children who are living their days and nights in rocky boats. And so when you get them in your preschool classrooms, make sure you're doing your best to hold the structure offering choices. Yeah, I know you already do this, but this time I want you to think with us about doing it for the brain. Remember, they need to feel in control of something and sometimes being able to say to them, do you want to eat the left side of your sandwich first or the right side of your sandwich? That's a choice. And guess what? You're being trauma sensitive because you're doing it with intention. All right. Making clear visuals. Now, some of our little ones don't have the vocabulary to fully understand what we're saying. Sometimes English is their second language. And so if you can couple your words with visuals, you are being trauma sensitive. And again, I think I want you to leave here today feeling I'm already doing some good things. This time, I just want you to say to yourself, I'm doing it for the brain because it's going to impact the heart. Uh, modeling, giving permission. Modeling, giving permission. Now, I'm just going to say in my household, my children have the permission to be sad, angry, upset, confused, overwhelmed. We just practice ways to talk about that. So a few weeks ago, my daughter out of nowhere, she said, mommy, I'm very angry with you. And I got down nice and low on her level. And I said, Madison, you have, you have a right to be angry with mommy. Do you want to talk about what's making you angry? So for about three seconds, she looked around the room. And then she said, I want ice cream. 
like it had nothing to do with her being angry, but just making safe space for permission to honor all of those feelings that are in your belly that you don't always know what to do with or, or how they feel. So we wanna make sure we're giving them permission. Number six, model and offer coping options. It is not okay to hit your sister. It is not okay to use your hands to, to hit another's child in our room, but you can go over to them and say, I didn't like that. You can come and ask me for help if they're not being good listeners. You can get some pencil and paper and draw some things. You can go over to our corner and, and stand there and maybe squeeze some Play-Doh. You have to give them options because team members, if I just said to you, uh, bubble up your anger. Let me see you make a bubble. Making a bubble doesn't help me process what's happening in my brain and in my body. So I need you to help me with some, some good, good suggestions for what to do when I need to cope. Number seven, you want to remind them to breathe. Sometimes when the brain has gotten overwhelmed and you have to do this for yourself first, you just need to breathe. You just need to breathe. And you want to remind them to breathe as well. And then number eight reminds us all about the importance of mindfulness. And again, mindfulness, mindfulness is just a, a, an approach to help everybody get themselves back together. And so many times as I'm thinking about these strategies, I want to remind you numbers one to eight are important for you too. Because sometimes the challenge that we have with co-regulating is it's not a co. I'm tired, I'm overwhelmed, I'm frustrated, you're getting on my nerves. And again, I think I can say this safely because we know how this feels and we don't want you to leave today like uh, 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 everything's going to be okay. You have to get yourself in the place to be able to do this first and then you can maybe go over and help co-regulate. So let's do one together before we get off the, the webinar today. So I think I want to do bumblebee breathing. That's the one I like to do the most. And now I'm advancing my slides and <laughs> they're going crazy. Rachel, can you put the one up for me? I just want to do bumblebee breathing. If I have still have, con oh my gosh, it's really going crazy. <laughs> All right, don't touch it. I'm going to do it. Okay. So let's do bumblebee breathing. So bumblebee breathing is something I did when I was a teacher and I do it with my children right here at home. So with bumblebee breathing, I like to just remind them that when they breathe, their belly goes out and in out and in but with bumblebee breathing i like to ask them to close their ears with me and they take a nice deep breath in and as they're releasing it i want them to hold their ears so that they can feel those vibrations all right so the the example says to put the finger in the ear i don't like to do that with kiddos my my strategy is to have them just close their ears they can still hear me and as they're blowing out that breath mm, I just want them to hear that sensation. I want you to try that and see what that does. Maybe not start it with a whole group, but maybe with one of your children who you know you need to help them better co-regulate because of some things that are in their suitcase, you can do what's called bumblebee breathing. And again, it's a, a nice deep breath in. And then I ask them to close their ears and then they blow it out. All right, try that. Try that. My daughter is really funny now. Her, her classroom teaches yoga and mindfulness. And so a few days ago, she was sitting on the bed and she was going like this. Mm. It was it was just hilarious to me. But I, I, I love it because here's what I think. Um, there was a woman who I was training several years ago and everything, every strategy I said, she said why it wasn't going to work. And she got me so frustrated that I cried. She made me so frustrated that I cried. And so as Rachel and I get ready to let you go today and you say, well, Nefertiti and Rachel, I already do so many things. I, this is too much. We would both say to you, you would want someone to do this for your child. You would want someone to go back and listen to this webinar, taking some of the strategies that can help them to be better as they work to heal the brain and, and heal the heart. Ordinary, not easy but ordinary things that you hopefully can try try today. So we knew this was gonna happen. 
it's hard to tackle all of this in, in such a short amount of time, but maybe we'll have an opportunity to, to do this with you again. But until we can see you again, go out there and squeeze the nectar out of what you're already doing, because you may not have known it to, before you listen today, but you are doing a lot of things already that are trauma sensitive and trauma informed. Keep on doing it. Keep, keep on doing it. You may have to do it a little bit more with some of your kiddos, but remember, you will want someone to do it with your child. Don't ask them what's wrong with you. Ask them what's the experience been like. We always do that. What's wrong with this child? In your head, say, what's happened to this child? And then finally, finally, heal the brain by creating safe space and be that buffer. Be that buffer that we know that our little ones need. Both those that we're talking about today, they actually all need it. So keep going out there and doing what you do. And then I love number four, be a therapist without being a therapist. Be a ther be therapeutic without being a therapist. We're not saying that all of your children are going to, maybe some of them are gonna need extra support, but you have what it takes to begin the process of healing the brain and healing the heart. You, you have that. So Sabrina, come on and stay close. I want to make sure our Devro team, the DCRC, the team that, that's listening that may not know about Devro, we are, um, I want you to maybe take the screenshot so you can come and hang out with us over at the Center for Resilient Children. Our colleague, Debbie Mahler, is actually going to do a pre-service conference. So if this was great, but you need some more, then make sure you sign up for the pre-conference session where Debbie will continue to unfold some of what Rachel and I tried to get you started with today. We thank you for deciding to hang out with us. Um, it's a lot of information and a little bit of time. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Sabrina, go ahead and take it away. So if you want to make sure that you can click on all of the links that have been provided here, including uh, the information about um, the pre-conference, be sure to download the handout. Um, you will be able to, to click on everything from there. I would also encourage you to check out um, our Head Start Advantage fact sheets, including our one about child welfare, um, which specifically talks about how Head Start uh, can really help um, help students who, who are dealing with adverse childhood experiences um, and, and seeing what impact Head Start has there. Um, we also always try to post our resources on um, the block, which is NHSA's online learning platform. Um, so you can always check out our resources that we have posted there. Um, and then you can check out our Year of Whole House website uh, and blog page to stay up to date with uh, everything that NHSA is doing. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, you can always reach out to me uh, at switzel at mhsa.org. Uh, and please be sure to complete the survey to share feedback with us after the webinar. Um, so I'll give you all another moment or two to download the handout uh, and just say thank you so much, everyone, for joining us here today. Okay. Thank you.